This is a picture of my seven-year-old son, Asher. He is the bravest kid I've ever met. It, seriously, when we take him on hikes, he's just like his mom. He'll walk right up to the cliff edge and just dangle his feet over it. He summited a 9,000 foot mountain. He climbs to the tops of trees. Even when he was little, like four or five years old, my wife would put him up in the branches of a tree and he'd be climbing up there seven, eight feet high. And she'd be at the bottom like, yeah, you're awesome. You're a champion. Go buddy. And I'm over here like, I'm terrified. Please let's not end up in the emergency room. Right. But he was not afraid of anything. And when he, except for one little thing, when he was little, when he was a toddler, he was afraid of the blue beast. We had one of those bulky Hoover blue vacuums that when you turned it on, it sounded like a NASA jet engine just revved up and it emitted this odor of like burnt hair and dust. I'm pretty sure it didn't actually vacuum anything off the carpet, but when I used it, I felt like I was achieving something. But he was terrified of this thing. Every time we turned it on, he would just scream and run away from it. He was terrified of it. And so one day I sat down with him before I got ready to vacuum the living room and I, I wanted to let him know, like, you don't have to be afraid. And so I told him, uh, buddy, who's in charge of the vacuum? When I'm vacuuming, who's got control of it? He said, daddy. I said, that's right. And does daddy love you? Yeah. Does daddy want to keep you safe and protect you? Yeah. I said, then that's great news for you. You no longer have to be controlled by the vacuum. You don't have to worry about it anymore because daddy's going to keep you safe. And he calms down. I said, okay, I'm going to vacuum now. And so I plug the vacuum in. I turn it on. It starts roaring, right? And I look over at Asher and he's got big alligator tears in his eyes. He jumps up off the couch, books it back to his room, screaming and hides in the dark recesses therein. He was mortified. He knew the truth, and yet he didn't experience the ramifications of the truth. I walked him gently through. I'm in control. I love you. You're not going to get hurt. And yet the fear that it was induced with, by the noise of the vacuum was much louder than my words. And he didn't trust me. I think that's often how we experience the gospel. We know the truth of the gospel. We know that Jesus died to set us free, to forgive us of our sin. But the question I want us to be wrestling with today is, are we experiencing it? Romans 1 verse 16 says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Paul says, Paul the Apostle, the author of Romans, he says, Look, I'm not ashamed of this gospel about Jesus because it is the awesome power of God at work rescuing people from their brokenness, their sin, their darkness. And while we know that truth, I want to lean into, are we really experiencing the, the ramifications of that truth? Are you experiencing the gospel in your life? The gospel means that we can have a secure relationship with Jesus, that we can walk in freedom, and that we have a future hope. And are those three words security, freedom, and hope indicative of your life. And I really want to lean into three promises of the gospel today that I believe if we, if we lean into those and begin moving towards faith in those areas that we will begin to experience the gospel. And I, I'm going to be up front. I'm going to be all over the New Testament today. Um, uh, and so I'm sorry in advance if you're one that likes to follow along in your Bible. Uh, I wanted us to have a robust picture of what the New Testament authors believed about what Jesus did on the cross for us. So we're going to start in Romans 3. Romans 3, Paul the Apostle, he is, uh, he's creating an argument. He's walked through uh, and kind of addressed two different people groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were God's chosen people. They were supposed to be like a beacon of hope in a broken world, showing the world what it was like to have a love relationship with the God of the universe. They had the commandments and the law. They had the prophets of God. They had the promises of God, the covenants. And then he, he also addresses the uh, Gentiles. The Gentiles were mostly pagan. They didn't believe in the God of the Torah like the Jews did. And here's what Paul says. Whether you're Jewish or Gentile, no one is righteous. He says, no one is righteous, not even one. And to a Jewish person, that would have just blown their mind. Because 
wait, I, I, I offer sacrifices. I worship at the temple. I, I follow the law and the commandments. They knew that the, the Gentiles had some issues, but they thought that they had earned their righteousness by following the works of the law. And so today I want to lean into the first promise is that Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin. Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin. If, if you know anything about the gospel, you probably know this. Jesus died to forgive us of our sins, right? In Romans chapter three, starting in verse 20, it says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin, right? The law does not make you righteous. You cannot do enough of what God requires to make yourself righteous. It's not about your effort, your work. You can't earn it. He said, the law was more like a mirror, right? When you look in the mirror, whatever's there, you see it, whether you like it or not. It just reflects what's already there. The law was like a mirror for our souls, revealing our sin, revealing our brokenness and revealing our need for a savior. He said, the law doesn't save you. Then he continues, he says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. He said, the law doesn't save you, but God has made another way, another way for you to be made righteous. It's the law and prophets both testify to. The law testified that, that we needed a savior. The prophets, the prophets spoke to who that savior would eventually be. And he goes on, he says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That's amazing. Jesus takes our penalty and he presents us to God as righteous, holy, and blameless. Jesus takes our penalty for our sin, the, 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 the just judgment of God that we should have eternal separation from him that his wrath was against us, Jesus took that because he lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. He lived a perfectly sinless life, but more than that, he lived a life of intimate fellowship with God. And then on the cross, he died for your sin and for my sin. And the wrath of God was poured out on him. God's anger, just anger as a righteous judge, judging evil was poured out on Jesus for your sin and for my sin. And when we trust in Jesus, our penalty can be removed. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again. Continuing on, he says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. I love that, justified freely. Apart from Jesus, there is no justification for sin. You can't make a good reason why you should, why you want to do something wrong. Jesus is the only one that can justify our sins. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. You see, it's, all, it's as if the, the valedictorian of the high school class, right? The, the straight A student, the one with the perfect attendance, the, the one that has all the accolades and, and school achievements goes to the high school dropout and says, I want to credit all of my accolades and achievements to your account and I will take the status as a dropout. Right? Jesus robes us in his righteousness. We get his credit for the perfect life and perfect sacrifice that he is. And he took our place on the cross, bearing the weight of the wrath of God. This is amazing truth. But here's the question. We know this truth. But are you experiencing the ramifications of it? You see, if we don't really believe this truth, here's what it will look like in our relationship with God. We'll be perpetually insecure rather than eternally secure. We will continually question, am I saved? Could God really forgive me? I got this big sin over here. I don't think Jesus really would forgive this one. I got to work hard to prove that I'm worthy of salvation. And you'll come to God and you'll beg and beg, please, 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 please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I'll do better. And you make all of these promises. That's indicative 
of insecurity in your relationship with God. And I'm not saying that it's not wise to evaluate whether or not you have truly trusted in Christ. But what I am saying is if you are a child of God, Jesus did not die so that you could be insecure as, his, as uh, a child of God. He died that you would be secure, that you would know that, that God's got a greater grip on you than you do on him. He died so that we could have the knowledge that God is our father and we are his children. God desires that for us. So which of those two phrases is more indicative of your life? Are you perpetually insecure in your relationship with God? Always questioning, wondering, could he really forgive me? Or do you feel that eternal security that you are God's? I want you to imagine that this Christmas, you're, you buy your kid uh, or your loved one the PlayStation 5, right? The, the hot new uh, video game system. You get them exactly the games that they want. They open it on Christmas. They're jacked. They, they play video games so their eyes bleed, right? December 26th morning comes. They come up to you, mom, dad, can I please have a PlayStation 5? Please, will you please get me one? I promise I'll do more chores around the house. I'll work harder. I'll, I'll get my grades up in school. I promise by the end of the semester, I'll have straight A's. Please, mom, please, please. I'll, I'll start listening to what you and dad want me to do. I'll do better. I promise I'll, I'll do better. What would the parents' response be? I've given you the gift. It's yours. I, I, enjoy it. Have fun. Play. This is your gift. And is that not what we often do with God? God, please, please, please forgive me. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't go to God and ask for forgiveness. That's biblical. What I am saying when we do that, we can have confidence. When, when we come to God, we should confess the sin, ask for forgiveness, and then praise him because we know because of the blood of Jesus, that sin is covered. It's been removed as far as the east is from the west. It's been dropped in the deepest oceans. Jesus himself said, it is finished. So are you experiencing security in your relationship with God? Or do you identify more with the insecurity, the worry, the fear? The next truth promise from the gospel that I really want to lean into is that Jesus saves us from the power of sin. And I believe this is the neglected promise of the gospel. That Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, as we've trusted in him and God makes us his dwelling place, really can give us power to overcome sin. Let's look at it in 1 John. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Jesus is the one who cleans us. He's the one who purifies us. He, he covers us over. And then he goes on and says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So there's this kind of dichotomy that even though we're presented as righteous in the here and now, today, you and I both struggle with sin. We both struggle to do life with God instead of doing life on our own terms. And he continues, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And we know that verse cannot mean that if we don't confess our sins, that we're not saved. Because we just went through a whole point in Romans 3 about Jesus is the only way to be made righteous. What I think he's saying here, this word purify is in the present tense. This is the ongoing work of God in you, the spirit in you, empowering you to overcome sin and the temptations to sin. And also to, to convict you of when there's sin in your life. And then give you the strength to repent of that sin and place your faith back in God. You see, prior to Jesus, we were all slaves to sin. We were shackled. We were in prison. We were in bondage. But after Jesus, 
He's broken the shackles. The prison door is open. We don't have to live that way anymore. He wants us to walk in freedom. For freedom, he set us free. Are you experiencing freedom? Or are you still in bondage? You see, I think even though the shackles have been removed and the prison door is open, it's very easy to put those shackles back on. Especially when we identify ourselves with this specific sin in our life. That's just who I am. That's who I'll always be. I'm a drunk. I'm an alcoholic. I'll always struggle with sex addiction. I'm self-righteous. I don't need Jesus. I'm a, I'm a good person. I make, I make good choices. I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I don't even smoke cigarettes. That's bondage too. Because sin is not just the big headline sins like murder and adultery. Sin in its essence is doing life without God. And the, the sinner who is in dark bondage that we can, we can tangibly see, addiction, is just as much in bondage as the sinner who's self-righteous and thinks they don't need Jesus because they're a good person. It's, they're both a prison cell. And here's the question. Jesus, if you are in Christ, Jesus has removed your shackles. He's opened the prison door. Have you walked out? Are you walking in freedom? I think one of the most important pieces about accessing this power that the Spirit gives us over sin is confession. That we confess our sins, not just to God. Look at it in James. James 5. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. He says, therefore, confess. Confession is, is agreeing with God about the brokenness in your life. It's saying, look, this is really what's going on in my life. And God, I know this is sin and it's wrong and it needs to change. But he says, not just to confess, but to confess to each other. Now that's where it gets a little scary because often what we believe is if I told people what's really going on in my heart and in my mind, if I told them the brokenness that I've walked in in my past or the self-righteousness I'm walking in right now, that they would reject me. And I, I want to gently lean in. This is not an option for us. This is a command. God wants you to walk in freedom. He wants you to be delivered from sin and he forgives you wholly and completely. It is a work of God. But this verse says, confessing to one another brings healing. Do you have somebody in your life, a trusted friend and confidant that you can be real about where you're really at? The good, the bad, the ugly. Do you have someone that you can be open and honest with? And I want to just lean into something. If somebody does come and confess something to you, your response really matters. If, you, if, if someone brings their brokenness to the surface with you and you say, gosh, I didn't know you did that. Or how could you have done that? Or, or maybe it's just, a stone wall and you're silent and you shut down the conversation because somebody else's vulnerability makes you uncomfortable. Look, this verse gives us direction on how to respond in that moment. Look at what it says. Pray, pray for them. Bring it to the Lord with them. Don't shut them down. They're trying to, to bring the darkness to the light so they can walk in freedom. That They want to walk in gospel freedom. Don't shut them down because they will go back into hiding. I hope that Family Church can be a place where we can bring brokenness to the surface. And if we ever want to see people walking out of bondage into freedom, we're going to have to be okay with more authenticity and transparency in our relationships. I hope that life groups can become a place where we are real. Not just with the surface level sins. Oh yeah, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. But really, what are you wrestling with? I was awful to my kids yesterday. I'm not supporting my wife or my husband. What, what are you walking through 
You need community. I need community. We need each other. Christianity is not a solo thing. It's not just me and God. He has created us to be in community with each other, that we might encourage one another, that we might pray for each other. And there's a helpful tool that Pastor Paul brought up a couple weeks back called Fruit to Root. And it, it, it can be very helpful for these types of moments where confession is coming to the surface. And it's simply examine the fruit of your life. Are you experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control? Or is it more like anger, frustration, uh, worry, anxiety? And then as you examine that, you can say, well, as I'm experiencing this fruit, what am I believing about myself? Ultimately, what am I believing about God? And then you can have this repentance moment. You have this confession of sin, repentance moment, and then you can confess the truth. Oh, God really does love me. God really is powerful. God really is in control. This is a valuable tool that I hope becomes a part of our culture that we can help people confess the sin and they make a positive confession of truth that they may begin to walk out of the prison cell. Um, when I was 18 years old, um, I was in active addiction. And I was dating somebody who was in active addiction as well. And I was homeless at the time. And um, one day I got a message from the girl I was dating that she was pregnant. And I was terrified. I knew my life was a mess. I, I, I knew I was living wrong. I didn't know how to get out of it. I had no tools or resources or know-how. It was all just chaos. And so terrified, we went to the doctor and uh, he laid out our options. And on that day, we chose together to get an abortion. And for the last 12 years, there's not a day that has gone by where I don't think about that baby, where I don't think about what they might have been like or, or uh, what they might be doing with their life at this point. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't regret that decision. And it had such power over me. It had such power over me that I was managing this hiddenness within me because I believed that if I let anybody into it, especially God, if I let anybody into it, then I would be rejected. It had such power that the hiddenness just grew. And there were more and more things that I was hiding and, and sheltering. I was managing my life around this hiddenness so that nobody knew. And internally, I was dying. The hiddenness just made my soul decay. And about three years ago, I knew it was time to do what John, James 15, or 5, 16 says. I needed to confess. I needed to share with a trusted friend what I had done. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was evil. And I needed to agree with God about that, confess it to somebody. And so my good friend, Zach, uh, I texted him and I said, hey man, I need to confess something at the end of service today. Can you stay after church? So we sat in the sound booth at Green and I told him the story. And even though I know Zach loves me and he's a gracious man, the, the, core, the lies in my mind are, he's going to reject me. He says, how could you do that? You're a murderer. I, I had all of these thoughts going through my head. Uh, and, and it was Satan trying to stop me from walking into freedom. And I sat there and talked to him. And at the end of my story, I'll never forget. The first thing he said was Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. And I just began to bawl. 
This was the beginning of walking in freedom from the shame and the sin and the hiddenness. And I can tell you now today that I can share this. And although it is a a difficult thing, a pain, and I know that it was wrong, I'm no longer controlled by that sin. That sin had power over my life for over a decade. And Jesus really does set people free. He, he, he set me free from the shame. He set me free from the hiddenness. We've got to be a place where we can share openly, where we can bring real darkness to the light. We don't have to hide anymore. There is power over sin in Christ. And I know that maybe some of your lives here have been touched by abortion. And I know this is a sensitive subject and I appreciate you being willing to let me share this. Uh, We have uh, some resources that I think will be very helpful if your life has been touched by abortion. Um, There's a ministry called Surrendering the Secret that Susan Hillman uh, heads up. She's one of our elders' wives. And there's a process where you go through and you grieve and you share with women who've been through similar things. And if that's you, um, please, on the back of your Connect card, will you please let us know that you're interested? Uh, we would love to connect you with Susan and, and help you walk in freedom. There is freedom in Christ. I promise. I've experienced it. The third promise that I want to lean into that the gospel promises us us, is that Jesus saves us from the presence of sin. Jesus saves us from the presence of sin. That one day we have a future hope. We will be with God forever in a perfect world. Let's look at it. Revelation 21 says it this way. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is a picture of God making everything new, new heaven, new earth. He goes on and said, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. God's going to dwell among us in this future reality of a, a beautiful new heaven, a new earth, and this beautiful imagery of new Jerusalem adorned as a beautiful bride. God is going to be among his people. He's going to be among us. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I love that. I'm an emotional guy, okay? I got lots of tears in these tear ducts, okay? He's going to wipe away our tears. There will be no more death or crying or mourning or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's beautiful. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be without those things because we've never had that experience. Our experience is brokenness and pain and suffering. And he goes on, he who was seated on the throne said, now God's going to talk. And he hears what he says. I am making everything new. Look at there's an exclamation point. This is like, it shakes the world. I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. I know you Oakland peeps. I've heard that your water bills are really expensive. God's going to take care of your eternal water bill, okay? Um, It goes on. He says, those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Like, this is an amazing picture. And the greatest part is not just that there will be no more death or disease or suffering or sin. The greatest part is this. He's going to be our God and we get to be his children forever dwelling together. Do you live with this perspective? Do you live knowing that one day 
We will be with God forever in a perfect world. You see, if we don't live with this perspective, we will live in despair. If we don't continually remind ourselves that we have a future hope, we, the, the, the despair of the world will drown it out. Are you eagerly anticipating this day that is a future reality for you if you are in Christ? This is true. If not, you'll live in despair. Which of those two words is more indicative of your life right now? Despair or hope? You see, there's a lot of bad news in the world. The last two years has been a lot of bad news. We all experience brokenness and suffering. And if that's the limit of our reality, there's nothing to hope in. But Jesus, because of his sacrifice on the cross, has purchased for us a a relationship with God. He has paid our price. And now one day we will get to be with him forever. Are you experiencing hope? There is hope in Christ. I began this message today with the question, are you experiencing the ramifications of the truth of the gospel? So are you experiencing security in your relationship with God? Are are you experiencing freedom from bondage? Are you stuck in patterns of sin that you can't get out of? And are you experiencing hope? You see, if you're not experiencing those three things, it is revealing to you that there's some unbelief and these core promises of the gospel. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys.